This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, as we know, engineering is the art of dealing with the fact that the world gives us a choice of good, fast, cheap, pick two. Amazon Web Services, which we saw earlier this quarter, is a solution for very large computation that is cheap in a lot of interesting dimensions. Today's speaker has something bigger and cheaper. <laughs> and it's actually older, too, which is sort of interesting. Adam B. Berg. All right, well, thanks. I guess I'll just get started here. So I'm going to kind of, my talk's in basically three parts. I'm going to talk briefly about what distributed systems are in my definition, because distributed systems is now a buzzword that's applied to everything in the world. So I'm going to define to you what I mean. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, designing and running these types of projects, kind of the ten last 10 years of what I've been doing, um, condensed into a few slides. Um, and then I'm going to talk at the end about some new work we're going to be launching soon, uh, a project called Storage at Home. Um, I'll, I'll insert here that uh, I like when people ask questions. This is like 10 years condensed into a few slides, so if you have questions, please jump in um, and, and let me know what you, you want to know. So um, as, as he said, this is a bigger system than something like Amazon. Um, if you take the 275,000 machines we have in a system like Folding at Home, um, that would be 6,800 racks full of computers. So I don't know how many football fields worth that is, but it's about 100 megawatts, which means you need a dam or a nuclear reactor or something to power it. Um, and if we were, in fact, renting uh, on Amazon's EC2 or um, doing co-location, it cost us about a billion dollars a year to do this, what we're doing. Um, so that gives you, we're, we're saving a couple bucks here by doing it this way. So if you look at when you have a lot of machines, there's two ways you can think about having lots of machines. Um, you can either think, I've got lots of machines, that means I can do more stuff, I can serve more web pages, I can do more you know, data mining, I can do more. Or you can think of it kind of how I like to think of it, which is, if you have twice as many machines, you can do something that you couldn't normally do for another year. So if you have 275,000 machines and other people have 1,000 machines, you can do things that wouldn't be possible normally for another eight years. So you can uh, use different algorithms, uh, uh, go deeper into a problem, do research that you wouldn't be able to do any other way, uh, or certainly not with, without spending a, a lot of money. Um, and this is a really powerful thing to, to kind of get through your head that, you know, with folding at home, we're doing things, we're starting to use quantum computing and other computational techniques that we would, there's no way we would be able to do those any, for years to come. So let's start with the problem of, I want to make something big and fast. Um, so what you do is you start kind of at the bottom. You look at vectorizing the problem. This is SSE or AltaVec from PowerPC. You take your machine, you say, I have, I can do things as vectors instead of as single, you know, A times B equals C, I can do those as vectors. So it speeds things up a great deal. Um, so this is something we did in the 90s. Everybody started using SSE. Everybody started using AltaVec. Uh, for example, when the, uh, when Apple converted from PowerPC to, uh, to Intel, this was the big deal because the, the way they did vectorization was different. So this buys you a bunch of speed. The next layer you would go up is you would start using uh, threading or streaming, and we've had great talks about CUDA. Um, I don't know if you've had to talk about Brook, which is ATI's equivalent of this. So I'm not going to address this really, other than the fact that, well, instead of putting four ALUs on a chip, let's put hundreds and hundreds of them on there and find a way to get data to, to where it needs to go. And this speeds you up. We're seeing 50x speed ups from this level of technology. Uh, then next is doing SMP, and this is you have multiple chips in your in your computer. 
Um, and you use threading. Threading could also be in this layer, depending on how you look at it. And you use this to you know, split your problem in two or something, try and make it go even faster. And then you reach the layer of clustering, which is where Amazon and Google, they rule this world. They have more machines and more of everything than everyone. Um, so this is, you've got a high speed network, you're interconnected, your machines are pretty reliable, and you want to do more of the same type of thing. The, that's the philosophy behind clustering. And the last layer, and if you're moving up the stream where everything you're doing promptly breaks, is that going distributed, which is crossing organizations, asking people to help you, using machines you don't have full control over. Um, so this is where you have to start dealing with high rates of failure, high rates of mistrust of the results and other things. So this is really where I'm going outside my organization. The example of Google, it's still all Google. They're not crossing over into anyone else where they have to ask someone to help them out. They have full control over the system. So when you're working your way up this stack, I mentioned you break at some point, and that's because it's, this is really about algorithms, how you're going to approach the problem, what you're going to do at, at each of these layers. And if you start from the bottom, things are going to break each time you go up a level. You have to start designing from the top down. Say, what do I want to do? What's my end outcome? What do I really want to get out of doing this massive computation? And that could be a very sequential task, like rendering the frames of a movie, in which case most of these questions are very simple. Um, but oftentimes they're not. And odds are, when you start from the top and design down, your algorithms that you're going to use are completely different than the ones you would use coming from the, top, or from the bottom up. And then, of course, once you've done your design, you can optimize you know, at each level however you want. Um, and there's active research in each of these layers as well as far as getting the tools to do this for us. Uh, vectorization is now done by most every compiler I know of. It will just do that for you. It'll look, see you have a loop. It'll divide it by four and do four times as much work each time. Um, there's compilers now coming out that are maturing for doing stream programming that are really getting good. So they can take a simple algorithm that you express kind of not in a very elaborate way, make it, spread it over hundreds of um, uh, ALUs and do that. So that's active research, but that's not really where uh, we're looking right now. Another thing is when you're taught each of these things. You're not taught that they're interconnected. You're really taught each thing as a separate individual thing you would optimize for and tune your algorithms around. You're not taught that this is a, really an algorithm stack that you need to learn and understand each piece fitting in with the other. Um, so when we're taught to program, we're generally taught that there's a CPU that can do the list of instructions we give it. It'll go and do what we want. It's not the hard, that doesn't reflect the hardware anymore. That's nothing like the hardware. Now the hardware is the CPU is the master of hundreds of resources that you can use. Uh, the latest uh, NVIDIA card has 376, I think, ALUs on it. It's like ridiculous. If you're thinking that the CPU is like this one thing doing something, you're really not going to get any kind of performance out of that. You have to shift to the mentality that the CPU is just telling people what to do and how that, um, how this is really going to happen, and it's just putting work out to other units, much like the cell processor. This is exactly the model they have. They have a main CPU and then eight computational units that can do things it's told to do. Um, and then you also have to understand pretty much from the beginning that your CPU is also not alone. You can use the network, and this is generally taught later in, in coursework for, <coughs> for computer science. So let's look at uh, kind of the attributes that we're going to start as we cross from this clustering into this distributed computing. What are the things we start to address? Um, the first is that when you're doing clustering, you're basically paying someone for the resources or you've bought the resources. You're dealing with either a contract, service level agreement, something like this. In distributed systems, you're dealing with untrusted machines that come and go as they please. Um, the reliability of distributed system is much less. Uh, not just the backhoes, but the com people can leave if they want. Things happen. These aren't machines in machine rooms. They're just probably on someone's desk. All kinds of crazy things happen to them. Uh, in centralized systems or clustering, generally most all of your machines are going to be the same thing. They're going to be you know, a thing in a rack with the Linux operating system. They're all going to be the same Linux operating system. Um, 
you're not going to have to deal with uh, you know, hundreds of different versions and combinations of DLLs in Windows. You're not going to have to deal with the Linux kernel, latest Linux kernel has a new you know, libc and all the code broke and won't link anymore. You don't have to deal with those things. And you do have to deal with those things in distributed systems. Um, we spent so much time trying to get Linux binaries to work on more than one distribution. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's bad. Um, in centralized systems, you can basically trust the result you're getting. You're pretty sure um, that what you've told the machine to do is what's going to happen. Um, you don't have to worry about hacking and other things too much or cheating um, in distributed systems again. Cheating is just a fact of life. And the big one I led with was the cost. The cost of centralized systems is however much you want to build, however much you want to rent, however much you want to pay. Um, in distributed systems, it's how much time you want to put into it, how much time you want to sink into recruiting, how much time you want to spend into making your website nice, how much time you want to spend into dealing with the press. It, it really channels into time equals scaling in these systems. <coughs> so let's, let's say we've got a system and we want to know, is this a distributed system or is this not a distributed system? Like I said, everything is now called a distributed system because that's the buzzword. But I consider the three central traits of a distributed system to be that you're crossing organizational boundaries. So you're, you're either cooperating with someone in a friendly way, like say DNS or email, or you're asking them to do something for you, um, like Folding at Home or any of these other systems. Um, the algorithms are different. You can kind of look at the algorithm and go, this is, you know, this is a distributed algorithm. This takes into account you know, these failures and all these other things. Um, and the third, which I'll touch on briefly later, is adversaries. In the distributed system, you have active people working against you. Hopefully not very many or very mean, but you do have people trying to cheat your system. Um, and that's, uh, we sp that's something that takes a lot of time. But, um, and of course, the internet used to be basically fully distributed. DNS didn't come along for a little while, and that was like the first thing where there was sort of a little centralization. But it used to be kind of free reign. Even back in the 80s and 90s, the internet firewalls hadn't come yet. All these, you know, the web port 80 wasn't the only way to talk to a computer. Um, so this was really something that we've centralized more and more and more over time. So let's look at the example of if our computation nodes were people. Because this is an easy analogy to draw. What if we were doing distributed systems with people? You'd get something like if you were doing news reporting, you would get um, blogs versus the news networks. So CNN versus the army of bloggers on, in the world. Now, the amount of news by bloggers is certainly far more. Often they're willing to do different things. They're willing to report on things that a major network would not report on. So you get completely different properties out of the, the blogosphere than you get out of centralized news. Um, if we look at the world of reference, we've got Wikipedia, which is, is so good now that um, the Encyclopedia Britannica is releasing their thing for free because they just can't sell it anymore. They have destroyed the world of encyclopedias because millions of hours by probably millions of people have been put into a system that is much more decentralized. Um, you get the property that you get, this introduces adversaries every time I've gone and introduced facts onto Wikipedia that get immediately rolled back. I don't understand quite the dynamic there, but um, there's, there is a lot of stuff happening there that's really exciting. Um, and then, of course, in software development, you get centralized systems where a company is in Windows or any com corporate uh, development model versus open source. And you look at the strengths of open source to, to explore the design space much more rigorously than than a centralized company where somebody is kind of feeding things from the top down would, where any of that would go. Um, so, now I'm gonna use the example of folding a home and the algorithm we use there and how it's different from what you would do in a centralized system. So a protein is produced basically as a long string of spaghetti and, it, and what it wants to do is fold up into a ball but you want it to fold up into the correct thing it has to fold up into the correct thing or you die. Um, so if you have genetic defects, it doesn't fold right, you get Alzheimer's or 
any of these other diseases related uh, to protein folding. So this is kind of important for us to understand how biology works and how these proteins fold and more importantly what can go wrong when they're folding and how you would maybe fix that with a drug or you know, prevent it from happening at all. So to go from this long single thread to something like what's in the slide, it takes a long time, it's incredibly complicated, and it's way beyond what we can simulate with computers. In billions of years, a single computer running, even if it's a supercomputer, can't possibly tell you how this is going to work and, and the properties of how this works. Um, you know, what are some, maybe a critical step it needs to make along the way? So what we use um, are Markov models, which um, if you don't know, it's basically, um, if you don't, say you didn't have maps and you wanted to get from, from San Francisco to New York, how would you do that? You'd have to say, okay, there's a local sign that says Sacramento. I'm going to go to Sacramento. And then from Sacramento, maybe there's a sign and it you know, takes you to the next step. And if you build up each step, you basically produce a map. And you eventually get to New York. And then you go, hey, there's a path from here to New York. So it's really about exploring more randomly, like, say, a colony of ants would explore. You've, you've got ants. They want to go find food. They don't just you know, know where everything is. They go explore. So you can go explore how things fold and do this in a way and build up this model later. Now, the trick to that is it lets you do short little things and put them together. Because here to Sacramento is like a short little thing. You can do, maybe do that. You can't just jump. To, you know, you can't, maybe you don't have jet technology. You can't get to New York yet. It's kind of the analogy there. Um, so you can get to Sacramento and build up this map. Um, but you can do those short little things with computers on the internet, things we have now. So that's what Folding Home really does. It's a completely different way of approaching the problem. People that approach this problem from the bottom up, this going from vectors to clusters, they build this dedicated hardware and they spend millions of dollars building these machines that just fold proteins. And they're really, really, really fast. And you still can't explore these big systems because it's still a billion times too slow to do these really big problems. But from the top down, you can explore these things. And you know, this is a ribosome. It's still actually too big for us to do. But we're doing parts of this now with these methods. Um, and the thing here that also this allows you to do is, like ants, once you learn something about what's going on, you can use that to decide what you're going to try next. So if ants find food, they lay down a trail and they go, hey, there's food over here. Let's do this. And then from there, we'll go look around for some more food. They don't go, OK, I'm always going to start here and ignore everybody else and all the things we've learned. And I'm just going to randomly go out. They don't do that. They, they learn. And, and so this model also lets us learn. So when we're producing job, the next thing we want to try in folding at home, we're, we're going to go out and base that on what we've learned. So let's look back at history for a minute and say, where did we learn this? Um, so here's something depicting cloud computing. Um, there's various machines on, the, on a network. They charge various amounts for what they do. This is basically Amazon's Elastic Cloud. Prices are a little different, but this is Elast uh, Elastic Cloud. This is Google Apps. Um, trick to this is, this was 1973, and this is a depiction of uh, David Farber's work on a system called Distributed Computing System. It ran, a project ran from 1970 to 1977. Um, they basically did all the things we do now in what we call cloud computing. They studied networking, storage, failure models, how, how to compute jobs, how to optimize a system like the cartoon. Um, but what we have now is way, way more powerful toys. Moore's Law has come and, and done what it does, and we have way more powerful tools now. But the theories and the things we're doing are the same things. <coughs> so I started doing this in a public way uh, in 1997. We had distributed.net. Um, we had 40,000 active machines. And my memory is bad, but it was about that. Um, and we tackled some problems that aren't, don't necessarily take this advanced you know, ant-like behavior. They just were pretty serial. There was a, we had a list of a, you know, two to the 56 things we needed to check, and we handed out chunks, and we did them. Um, 
the goal here was to fix the crypto laws. If you remember back in the early 90s, every piece of software had two versions. They had the, if you're in the United States, click here. And if you're not in the United States, click over here. And the one that you clicked over and got the foreign one was using these crypto algorithms. And they were really weak. Um, we actually, working with the uh, EFF, cracked DES in 22 hours. So that, that's not strong encryption anymore. That's, that's weak. So we got the laws changed, they went away, now software all has one version, it's got good strong encryption in it. But what we really learned in this phase, and this was the, one of the early projects that gathered a group of people and kept them together for more than one project. There were many other projects in the day. Um, there was uh, DS Chow, which was just that. There was Mersenne Prime Searching, which I think is still going on. There's tons of these little projects, but they were like one project. And this, we really learned how to keep volunteers in our project and, and learned kind of those lessons of how to gather a group of people together and really you know, channel them into something. This is Folding at Home, this is ongoing. It launched in, in 2000. Um, I met Vijay Pandey in 1999. We collaborated at various levels over, over time. I'm now in his lab. Um, but this is the 275,000 number. This is how many machines we have out there actively working that we're hearing back from. This isn't like 275,000 people signed up. This is how many people are actually running our work right now. So this is a billion dollar system to us. Um, we've got Windows, Mac, Linux. We've got PS3s now, which is the Sony PlayStation 3. We've got GPUs, so we're uh, betaing uh, an ATI client. And again, like the PS3 or the GPU are using you know, streaming and other things like that to go even faster than uh, Windows um, machines would. <laughs> and this is all dedicated to protein fold. All this is protein related research. Um, and there's 54 publications out of this. Uh, unfortunately, not many of those are mine. Um, <laughs> so let's look at how do you get volunteers? How do you gather a group of people together to help you? If you, wa you wanna get this billion dollars of value out of people, you've, you've gotta be doing something, right? Um, so they have to be motivated to help you. Um, this is really hard. Like we spend so much time and we learned so, I learned so many lessons back in the day, but this is a really hard problem. Dealing with human beings is always a hard problem. This is like beyond NP hard. It's just <laughs> difficult. Uh, NP hard is trivial compared to dealing with. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole different set of skills you have to learn to do this type of thing that are not computer science skills. They're sociology, they're psychology. Their you know, motivation and all these other things. Um, the main vectors here are word of mouth um, and just the scientific press. So as you, you're first starting out, it's really just word of mouth um, and, and maybe you get lucky and you're slash dotted or something like that. Um, and the first rule of all of this is you have to be absolutely good about what you're doing. Um, as I say, not evil is, isn't good enough. So if you're a company trying to do this, forget it. If you're uh, a, not a nonprofit. If there's any profit anywhere near what you're doing, forget it. It's not going to happen. People will not help you if they don't think you're like out there to help humanity or the world or things like that. There's lots of projects like this they could be doing. This is really a competition about how good you are, how what benefit you're bringing to humanity. So th I mean, there's probably a hundred active projects right now. Um, there's four really big ones. Um, there's uh, two protein projects, uh, SETI at Home, and there's another one, I forget what it is. It's something in blank. But there's, there's like four really big scale ones. And then there's lots of little ones that are about a thousand maybe computers. So getting past that point, you have to actually be doing something good for people. You have to be absolutely transparent in what you, about what you're doing. This is what we're doing. This is what we're gonna find out. This is what we're gonna publish. This is the data we're gonna make available. Uh, just really you know, doing, saying exactly what you're going to do. Um, another big thing is this is better for early research, so fundamental scientific research. If, if you were, say, doing really late stage where a product was like imminent out of the research, this really wouldn't work for you. If you were a drug company trying to do this or like working closely with a drug company, like they, nobody would help you. Why would they help you? You're just helping a company, the evil company. We don't want that. So <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, you have to, I can't stress enough how important this is to really be totally transparent and upfront with people, or they're really gonna just go somewhere else. <coughs> so why do people help? And this is the sociology, and I love to partner with someone and actually write a paper you know, with air bars on what I kinda know. Um, 
people want to be, they really like to be interested in something. They love to be hooked and interested. So with us, it's research, it's, uh, you know, it's aliens with study. It's, it's what's your, what's interesting about what you're going to produce? Why is this cool? Why is it, why is it neat? What, what does it do? Um, so that's very important. Um, altruism, just people wanting to help, you know, we're using idle computer cycles, it's on anyway, you know, why not, right? Um, competition and reward are, of course, primal to human beings and dealing with them. So competition is in the form of teams and stats. If you help us, we give you points. If you help us more with more computers, we give you more points. If you and your friends get a team together and form a team, your team can com compete with other teams. And so this is very, you know, video game point kind of motivation. But it also really helps because we want people to help us and we can tune those points so that, for instance, we've got um, GPUs right now and we've got CPUs. So there's a thing of which do, you, and the GPU requires your CPU to be doing some heavy lifting still. So which do we want them using? Do we want them to use the GPU or the CPU? So we tune the points so we can get the most science out of what we're, what we're asking people to do. Um, rewards, we have things like the little printable certificates and things on the website. And, and you know, that's, that's nice. You know, it shows that we care about them helping us. And so that's very important. And then just things about gift economies. People feel good about helping and doing things. And their status, if they can say, hey, I did this good thing, it does actually help them. So, so that's a great thing. Um, so people are helping us for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but fundamental is this, what is it being really produced? So if you want to do a project like this, you know, really consider all these things um, that you've really got to have in order to do something like this. <coughs> So implementing these systems, you have to actually build it. You actually have to test it. You actually have to have servers. You have to have bandwidth. You have to have all these things to do this. This is like profoundly time consuming. But compared to a billion dollars, yeah, you know, you know, we'll do what we have to do. It's, it seems pretty simple in that, you know, that balance. Um, so we have to develop the software, test the software. We roll out alpha testing. We do beta testing. We do the eventual rollout. We, do, we have bugs. We fix the bugs. We upgrade new versions, so we have to do all this cycle again. We, we maintain the website, the statistics, and this is all done by many people. We've got <coughs> moderators on the forum. This is, you know, this is an, a large number of people all working on this. Um, and then every time something comes along, like the PS3, you have to do it all again. You know? So <laughs> there's a large amount of work that goes into something like this. So this isn't free in any sense. You're spending, investing a lot of time. Yeah? Are they willing to have you spend so money? They're actually thanked in the, at the end. They do fund part of our research. Um, but yeah, uh, getting infrastructure money, as my understanding is that's a little harder than getting money to just pay people to do things. Well, it's but not generally perceived. It's, it's perceived dimly because it's not original. The NSF right. does not like to anchor, boat anchor itself with infrastructure. OK, so infrastructure is an original work, which they're not, it's not a frontier, you know. Running a website and stats is not frontier science. It's slogging along, doing something you have to do. Yes? Just out of curiosity, as far as new platforms, why wasn't the 360 or any of the other? Um, ah, so, a lot more. so the heating is the 360's reason. <coughs> we actually used to, uh, AMD for a while had a line of chips. I forget how long ago it was, but it was quite a while ago. It wasn't cooled enough. And we like optimize all up and down from vectors all the way up and down the stack very extensively. Gromax is the main piece of software we use. A lot of people put a lot of effort into that. It's not actually by our group or anything. But it's a piece of software that's highly optimized. So the chips get really hot. So the Xbox, who has cooling problems with the games, like you can't possibly do that. PS3 was designed a lot better. So the cooling was taken care of. I think you have to like literally put a blanket over them or something to like get them to overheat at all. Um, so they were able to do this. Um, so every time we do a new piece of hardware, there's vendors help us do this. Um, even when we were doing really early ATI work, the video cards couldn't, weren't quite up to that. But ATI has been doing this, they've got their stream programming effort. So they've, they've been doing this for years now. So they've been designing their cards to handle this. Because when you're actually doing a, a game, your GPU is only probably 40% active at any given time. Or it was just kind of 
crash and have I don't know what they do. I don't have one. I think they go red or something. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I don't know, but no, it wouldn't. That's the fine. other the other main fundamental issue of the 360 is that the processor that has the power is not available to us via APIs. It's something Microsoft guards internally, but it does have a, I think it's an NVIDIA chip that was pretty high end at the time, but none of the compilers were. I mean, the compilers for stream computing are just now getting mature. So two years ago or whatever, like it wasn't even possible. We'd have to like do assembly or something. I think. There's n there's no tool chain for that. What? VB. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's visual be basic. Yeah. Um, so we get the system, but it upgrades itself. People are upgrading their machines all the time. People are buying PS3s. They're buying new GPUs. They're doing this for us. So that actually, the system self upgrades, which isn't something you would get if you were co-locating or something like that. Um, and like, like I said, we have help. We, there's moderators in the forum. There's a large group of people that work on this. And all of them kind of do their part. So I mentioned I talk about adversaries. Um, you're giving people points, so bad people could want more points. Um, you're trusting people to do your computation correctly. Um, we don't have this problem too much. Because if they did the computation incorrectly and did something better than we're doing, we'd actually like them to do that. But that's not true of all projects. SETI at Home, for example, um, has to have two people do every, every bit of work because the answer is yes or no. Is there a signal or isn't there? So there's no way to like, double check that. With the protein folding, if it's a lower energy state, like we'd actually like to know. Um, so there's things we have intrinsic in the problem we're doing that guard against this. Um, but basically, if you're really good, people aren't going to mess with you too much. And that's just a great thing because we only have so much time to, to fight back. But there is a lot of stuff we do to check that people aren't cheating. Uh, I'm not going to detail them because they're actively in use, um, which is unfortunate. But basically, there's a lot of checking going on under the hood. What? Measures in use. So and with distributed, so, so you have cases by the Yes. So I could talk more about distributed .NET, I guess. Um, because we were looking for an encryption key, it was a yes/no answer. So people wouldn't ruin it by saying no just all the time. What they'd do is they'd say no to the same thing over and over and try and get through the stat system or have multiple people submit the same no to the same set of keys. So I mean, it's, it's, if you're being good, people are going to try to kind of cheat on your stats maybe, but they're not going like, to mess with your research. It doesn't help anybody. Just, this, you know, Windows is much more fun to mess with, right? <laughs> so um, they're going to go that way. Um, and you know, things like rootkits and spyware are, you know, spyware will run at a higher priority than our programs. All these distributed computing projects run at the lowest possible priority. So when you go and try and watch a movie or anything, nothing is stopped from happening. Um, so spyware and stuff, it's busy sending email at a higher priority. So it actually like, you know, slows our stuff down. So we, you know, we can't really do anything about that. But that's something that certainly is. Uh, people have noticed spyware because they weren't getting enough points. Another cool trick, and we did this with distributed.net uh, a couple times, is when people would steal laptops. Our software would still be there checking in, sending stuff in. So we'd have this, you know, they'd say, oh, my laptop was stolen. It's still running. Can you, you know, I'm still getting points. It's, somebody turned it on. Can you, like, give the ISP log or the IP addresses to the police? And, uh, and SETI's done this. We've done this. So there's, there's some cool tricks that, you know, but uh, that really has nothing to do with That's just a cool side effect of what we do, I guess. We didn't put that in there as a design feature. So platform trends. Hardware is changing, as you know. We're going from, we've gone from mainframes to PCs. We're in the middle of PCs to laptops. And we're starting to do laptops to small, ultra-portable devices. The problem for, uh, from our point of view is that laptops aren't on all the time. They're not network connected all the time. Certainly, the iPhone doesn't have enough power to do stuff. So as people transition to smaller, more ultra-portable devices, we actually lose hosts. The lucky thing is, as this is happening, things like the PS3 and your set-top box and all these other things that are basically home servers are appearing. So as in the future, I can see clients for you know, more of these set-top box type machines, and we'll, you know, less and less people will buy a full-scale PC. Um, 
And that's great because they're much you know, more portable, but it's an issue for us. Um, green is good. Uh, nobody can say green is bad. But if the machines shut off all the time, it's not good for us. Um, so the, the more and more aggressive people get about being green, um, that actually makes people maybe not consider doing things like distributed computing. Um, but there's still plenty of people. We're still seeing linear growth. It, people are still signing up every day. So we're not to this point yet, but it is something to think about in the future that's going to eventually happen. Um, performance of those hosts, um, more people sign up. The machines they're signing up are getting faster, and the machines they, they you know, upgrade are getting faster. Um, the networks, the DSL connections are all getting faster. So we're, and then, of course, they're doing this for us. They're just maintaining it because they want to use their PC. So we're riding like three or four exponential curves here. So this is getting not only more powerful every day, but rapidly much more powerful all the time. When we went and started the PS3, the PS3, we're seeing, you know, not, it's not 50x, but it's like 20x faster than uh, a PC would be. The GPUs are 50 times faster now, and the next generation will be 100 times faster than, a, than an Intel chip. So, I mean, that's a huge jump on that Moore's Law curve. Actually, I think it just brought us up to where we should have been the whole time, but it gets us back up where, you know, this thing is growing and becoming more and more powerful as time goes on. So now I'm going to talk about a new project we're going to be launching uh, <coughs> fairly soon, actually, um, called Storage at Home. And the goal of this is to not only do computation in a distributed way, but do storage that way as well. Um, and we'll use, you know, we'll monitor the system, we, we'll repair things that get lost. Um, but this really opens up a whole new uh, set of opportunities and things we can do. And the reason this is really important is that there's a step two to science. First, you ask your question and you do a bunch of computation and you produce all this raw data. And then, then there's this other step, which is you have to ask the questions, you have to analyze the results. Um, we've got about 300 terabytes of data so far, and we're growing 75 to 150 terabytes a year. So this is a very, ex this is an explosive data problem for us. What do we do with all this data? And more importantly, how the heck do you go through that data to look, ask those questions in any kind of way that gets you where you want to go in a time period that's reasonable? Often now we have to wait a week or a month even for a really detailed question to be answered through the raw data. Um, and then just, of course, storing this data, processing it, I mentioned, and backing it up. Right now we're shipping a lot of it over to one, I think it's Pittsburgh, um, supercomputing center who's doing backups for us. But getting it over there, even over in it too, isn't the like, easiest thing in the world to do. So backing this data up is, a, is a, a, a problem. So let's look at the current topology of all these pro all the distributed computing projects use this basic idea. Um, they've got some kind of load balancing up front. They've got work servers that have computational tasks on them. And they've got, in the case of storage at or folding at home, we've got a backup server that results can go to if your, your server is dead. Um, so a client appears out of the mist. Um, we give it a job. Uh, then, uh, wait, am I looking at the wrong slide here? <laughs> I, I think I'm one ahead of you. It fell off the network. It fell off the network. OK, we gave it a job. It, 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 I've got two on my screen. So. Um, so it's non-persistent. It comes back. It says, hey, I'm back. I've got a job. We go, yay, they're back. Um, probability you know, achieved. Um, and they give the job results back to us. Um, and then the job is done, and the client disappears into the ether again. Um, and then this goes on and on. They'll come back, immediate, probably immediately say, I want more work. The job will go out. Everything will happen. So this is what, what's going on right now in all, pretty much all these projects. So what we need to do is reverse the flow. Um, we need machines online available to us. So we're asking them to open a port so we can contact them. You can't do distributed storage if you can't get to the storage when you need it. Not much use to that. Um, so this allows us to do storage. But it also allows us to do um, the, the types of different types of jobs, quicker jobs, to do um, change priorities. So this is something um, that in if you've ever done research, the conference deadline is in eight hours. I need to do X right now, which is not something we can do right now. 
I, with this system, we'll be able to say, I need these 10,000 jobs done right now. We can ship them out with a high priority, and whatever those machines are doing will stop, and they'll do the immediate thing, and we get our answer back very quickly. So that's flexibility you don't have if people are just checking in. <coughs> so here's the new topology, and I'll try and stay on the right slide. Um, so you have a presence server, which, you know, is managing who's online, who's not online, who's gone down for reboots, who's just missing in action. Um, you have a coordinator who's managing both your jobs and your data. And this is the ma master control of the system. You have probably many job servers, machines that have things to do. And then you have a bunch of clients that are online and available to you with various amounts of storage and various amounts of jobs that maybe are already happening or are queued up to happen, or things like that. So the first thing you can do is send jobs out. So you move a job from you know, one of these job servers to a client. Um, maybe I'll just watch this one. Um, then you can move data around. You want to optimize where it is to decorrelate the data, and I'll cover this more extensively later. But you can move data around to where you want it to be, equalize all the load, do a bunch of things like that. Um, when jobs are done, they go back to the job server they came from. So this is the results coming back. Slightly different way, but basically the same idea. And then the job is, when the job is done, you create more jobs based on what you've learned. So this is kind of the new flow, and it's kind of exactly the opposite of what was there. <coughs> so let's address the storage part of this. Um, we want to turn all these machines we have into like this giant, gigantic RAID server, uh, multiple copies of data all these things. We just want this huge, vast amount of storage. Um, and it allows us to run these you know, step two calculations. Run, we know where the data is. We send the computation to the data. Instead of bringing the data to us, we just send the computation to them. This is a very old idea, and it's, it's a really good idea. And if it weren't for firewalls, we'd still be doing it <laughs> all the time. Um, <coughs> and we can also set up bigger mirrors. For example, at Pittsburgh, we could set up just a huge repository versus um, the scale of this is we're allowing people to use 10 gigabytes on a machine. Now, with terabyte drives coming out, that may seem kind of small or it may seem big if you've got an older system. Um, but this is actually based on needing to get the data and repair the system and do the redundancy. So based on an average American DSL connection, which is you know a hundredth the speed of Europe or Japan, um, this is kind of how much we can expect from one person, that we can access, get to it, uh, migrate it if we need to, do computation on it. There's not too much there where they're always trying to do computation on, on results. Um, so it, it works out pretty good. Um, with 100,000 hosts, because you have to open a firewall port and do some other things, and actually use storage, we're not expecting everybody to do this. Um, so about 100,000 hosts, if we can get up to that, that's a petabyte of raw storage. Um, distributed across 100,000 machines. Um, now, this is where everybody starts talking about distributed hash tables and erasure codes and all that stuff. We can't do anything fancy. We need to actually compute on the data. So we're not doing anything fancy. It's just a copy of a file. Files run from about 10 to about 100 megabytes. In our load, um, you would want to favor s files about that size. You'd want you know, a good number of files on uh, per machine, but you wouldn't want too many. So it's a pretty good balance. Um, so we need these files actually intact. So um, there's a full copy of a given file on a given machine. And then this just adds to the amount of points we'll give you for, for helping us. Um, there's less motivation actually to this because you're only allowed one. Um, you can't set up you know, many, many machines in your, in your home because your DSL connection wouldn't, doesn't scale. You can set up more machines, but it doesn't do any good, um, I guess you could say. Um, so what we want to do is get copies of this data out and remove all the correlations. So this is, we don't want two copies in San Francisco. There could be an earthquake. We don't want them in New Orleans because that's below sea level. We want them spread around the world. Um, we also don't want uh, time zones to be the same. We'd like, ideally, to be able to assign you jobs at night when you're probably not using the computer and you've probably told it you're, it's allowed to, to help us during, at night. So we want things spread out in time zone as well so that whenever we want to do something, it can, it can happen. Um, 
You don't want things from the point of view of Stanford to be on the same internet segment or route. So um, for instance, um, if you're in Minnesota and Minneapolis, almost all your internet traffic actually goes through Chicago. There's very few high-speed links that don't go to Chicago to join the backbone there. Um, so from, you know, this isn't something we'll weigh heavily, but this is an issue. Or if, uh, for instance, Stanford's network, you don't want tons, you wouldn't want tons and tons of machines sitting at Stanford or, say, uh, UIUC or something, because they're all on the same network. When that network goes down, you're going to lose them all, and you don't want that. Um, so companies or schools, another thing you want to try and get different copies of that file onto. Um, of course, if they're the same user or the same team, you don't want to put the, give them, you know, you don't want to give all four copies to the same team, because if they all get pissed off and quit, you lose a file. That's, that's something that happens. Whole teams get up and leave these projects and go to another one. Um, so it's not just, you know, people dropping off randomly. There are strong correlations between that. Um, and of course, operating systems. Um, and this leads into, two, there's two types of failures we care about. There's a machine going offline and data loss. So when you're talking about a machine going online, offline rather, um, this happens all the time. Every time you reboot, every time your DSL goes down, every time uh, you crash, every time, you know, these are very frequent events for, for the kinds of computers we're talking about. Um, they're basically random for the most part. Um, you know, there's no way to really predict that. So you just want to spread things out. There's the coordinated kind too, and this is actually a really big effect. On Patch Tuesday, every Windows box on the planet, as you go around the time zones of the world, reboots. So it looks, if you're not aware of this, like a massive cascade failure. <laughs> but it's not. It's totally normal. Every month this happens. Um, sometimes it's not till Thursday that all the machines crash because the patch wasn't right. But you have to anticipate things like this, these correlated events for the operating system. When the new um, Red Hat or Ubuntu or however you say that comes out, um, everybody patches and reboots. Um, the Mac patches whenever there's a new uh, security patch. All the Macs reboot. Um, so these are look like massive failures. You c if it's a Windows, one of these reboots, like 85% of the machines you've got contact with are just blinking out. And, and so this is something you have to be able to anticipate that these are not a big deal. Like when these happen, it's okay. Data was not lost. Um, but if you get to a low threshold, like two copies, you'd want to take action anyway. So you'd want to preemptively say, well, this is getting a little scary. I still want to have a couple copies at least. Um, and then the other mode is the complete failure mode, data loss. Um, this actually doesn't happen that often. There's, it's not very often you lose a hard drive like where it's just completely thrashed. You're usually able to recover the data. It's usually not that horrible of a deal. Um, the main thing you're talking about here is people leaving your project. So um, it's about you know one percent a day churn, um, but that churn isn't uniform. People that have been with you a while are probably going to stay with you for a while more. Um, people that come in do like three days worth and then decide, you know, this, what's this stupid icon in my tray and they turn it off. So those people are much more, more volatile. Um, How do you know since Comcast is ready to turn them down? Well, you don't. You, for, for, for 24 hours in our case, and I'll get to this a little more, but you consider them to be in the first class until they demonstrate they're not. Um, and you trust older pe people that have established a reputation more than you've uh, trust machines that just came online. But the bottom line here is if you're using geography and all these other things you've decorrelated, um, it's still really reliable. It, pretty insanely reliable, actually. Um, so we're doing active monitoring. Um, <coughs> you, we'd like to have four copies at all times. That gives us about eight nines of reliability if we decorrelate correctly. We can tune this later if we want to. Um, but this is actually, it's much, actually much better than that because we're, we're not looking every day. We're watching the system at all times. So we can actually repair 1% of damage in the system in about 30 minutes. So it's, we can repair things much, much faster than a 24 hour period. So we actually get like more nines, but after a few nines, it doesn't really matter because Stanford goes down. And then everything's offline. 
Um, and we will have redundant sites for the master, all these servers and other things like that. But if Stanford's internet link goes down, effectively the system is at zero availability. And that's probably, that actually happens quite a lot <laughs> more than you would lose files by any other way. Um, you lose availability. But again, that's an outage, not a failure. Um, we also try and keep posts about having the same amount of data because you want to be able, when new data comes in, you want to store, you want to be able to you know, put it wherever you want. You don't want to have to say, oh, 95% of my hosts are just full. I have to store it all on these other 5%. That's, that's not good. So we're moving stuff around at all times to, to keep these equalized. Um, and of course, you've got to talk about what we need here at Stanford to do something like this. Um, you need the metadata for the files. It's about 2,000 to 1. So if we have 250 terabytes, it's really you know, something that will fit on a hard drive very easily and can be copied around pretty quickly. Um, we have the overhead of pushing data out that we have already. Um, and this is actually a big deal. We've got a lot of terabytes of data. Even with Internet 2, this isn't all that easy, easy to do. Um, but it is critical that we have Internet 2 or like we would, wouldn't, just wouldn't push out old data at all. It wouldn't be an option. Um, Stanford's link to the commercial Internet is, is pretty slow, so uh, relatively. It's still fast compared to DSL. But, um, so we can't just saturate Stanford's Internet connection for three months. That doesn't <laughs> go over well with the IT folks. We've warned them. Um, and then, of course, new data will store as it's created. Um, when a job is done and has created one of these big files, it'll just be replicated and then it will be told, oh, go check them, go verify things are where they should be. But we don't have to bring it all back anymore. Um, we probably still will because we want a copy or we'll just directly ship it to a backup site. Um, but that, once the system is steady state, the bandwidth usage is actually pretty minimal. Uh, so that's the end of the storage section. If you have storage questions, now would be the time. All right. Do you send data between clients directly? Yes. Um, as opposed to taking it through Stanford? Yes. The coordinator can basically tell hosts to move data around or move jobs or anything. So it's got, it can uh, essentially delegate authority to, to machines out on the network, standard PKI stuff. There's nothing too fancy about that. Um, but yeah, you can move things around or tell hosts to move things without coming through Stanford. Reason why things like BitTorrent just weren't relevant. So, BitTorrent's a completely different thing. Um, BitTorrent is, I want to send the same data to lots of people. This is, I want four copies, specific places. So there's no there's no bandwidth savings. In fact, BitTorrent doesn't actually save any bandwidth. Um, it's just really good at doing the swarm, uh, or. Transmission pricing. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's it's good at uh, avoiding ISP fees. <laughs> um, but yeah, something like BitTorrent is designed for a completely different purpose than this. Um, this is more standard file system stuff. Yeah. Does this work with random nap boxes all over the place? So the one of the boxes on an earlier diagram is the presence server. So that's handling uh, who's online, where they are. Every, every machine has a specific ID, a, a public key. So when they check in and say, I'm over here now, their IP address has changed, which I think is what you're asking, um, then we know where they are. Their location is updated. You actually also use that, I think, part of the question. So are you also using the methods that allow two boxes that are defined in app to be able to communicate directly with each other? There's an introduction. Uh, if there's no port drilled, no. Okay. We're not doing the evil Skype algorithm. Well, <laughs> or, or the good Skype algorithm. It's, it's almost, yeah, it's tacitly, it seems to be tacitly approved now. So. Yeah, I, I guess everybody didn't. But no, we don't need to do that because we're asking them explicitly to open a port. So that can happen without having to do crazy tricks. Most everybody knows how to do that now because a lot of games or, you know, Skype or iChat require you to. definition of most everybody that I do. My mother wouldn't have a clue. People who run projects like this know how to do this. <laughs> I think we're, you're knocking but we're also door. saying, you know, we're not expecting everyone to do this by any means. We do know some people won't know how to do this, or some maybe some DSL things just won't allow that. You know, that's that's life. Um, but um, yeah. Oh well. Yes. Okay. Have you talked about changing jobs not taking over? 
Yeah. Or, you know, someone right clicks that icon and says, go away, or uninstall. Yeah. Do you have any sort of just system that's like, oh, let us back up your data since you're leaving. Thanks again for your help. Yeah, I mean, it would ask you, like, uh, actually, when you reboot, it automatically lets us know, like, there's been a reboot. Um, if you close it, it'll say, are you going away? Are you Here's another correlated event in the spring. A quarter of the university population disappears and goes to slow DSL connections or you know, somewhere else. So this is a massive event in the end of May, beginning of June, where, th where people will go offline. They won't lose data, but they're probably going to take two or three days to move, settle in, set up their computer again. So we'll like, have a way for them to tell us, hey, I'm going away for a week. I'll be back. Um, so yeah, that is certainly a design element. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing things in sort of a batch mode, and your jobs coordinator pushes jobs over to the right. machines. What happens on the network and, re and computer resources and jobs coordinator if interactivity is involved? So you're saying what if the job, we're, the thing we're sending them uses the internet? Right. No, interactivity, you know, interaction. So there's no interactive jobs in this. Uh, I'm going to get to this in a second. We'll go through the, what the jobs do. Yeah, you're going to be, uh, we've seen a lot of, Interesting data re recently about silent data corruption. Are you going to be able to track that in your storage system? So yeah, the verification process actually runs checksums on the data you have. So if there's data corruption, we'll spot it and mark it invalid and make new copies. No, no. Or, Are you going to be tracking how much data corruption you're getting? I'll say yes, because that's a good idea. <laughs> so we'll do that, yes. You, you need to look at the paper in the... Fast conference in February about silent data. Oh, is this a drive failure paper? No, not oh. about drive failures. This, okay. That's another interesting paper, right. but the, the, the one that you need to be concerned about is about um, the rate of silent data corruption in, in storage systems. Yeah, we'll be swipe, uh, sweeping the system for data corruption fairly often because the overhead of doing that is so low. So it, right, because it certainly is a concern right that the, the data is just still there but corrupted, but they haven't told us, hey, I lost some data. So it's something we're actively sweeping for, yeah. Are, are you modeling the process? Like the hard drives have, you know, the standard bathtub models? Uh, actually, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other paper says no, they yes. don't. Oh, they yeah, don't. they don't have, they're not modeling drive failure. We're not, because we're not actually tracking no, the, the okay, drive. The, non -dri what? the others, not the drive. Are you modeling the others to try to see if there are no kind of modes, like somebody's active going around or whatever? Uh, probably you not could, initially. You could look at the statistics. We, we'll certainly you have know, a whole. Like of modeling, you yeah. can do. Uh, we'll certainly have a set of data about hosts on the internet, and a large number of hosts on the internet. We'll have you know internet out outage statistics. We'll have reboot statistics. We'll have a, a whole new set of data. Luckily, we have a distributed system to process that data, so we can look at it and see what's in there. But certainly, we'll have all those statistics every time something goes down, every time something's lost. One thing. Yeah, I guess if we wanted to look more carefully at like what kind of hard drive you have or other things like that, we could certainly collect all that data. See if Comcast is throttling you. Oh, well, we know they're throttling. ISPs are throttling. But yeah, we certainly collect all that data and make it available to people. And just to clarify, this is storage for, for protein folding at home. It's not storage at home in a, in a general. So that yes, storage at home is specific to the protein folding data. The more general project is will come later when I'm trying to get tenure. Um, <laughs> Don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a huge history of failure of, of distributed uh, storage systems going, oh, we'll see back, if this one going back to the mid-90s. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the, and, yeah, and you're right. The history of failure in these is very high. The element that's lacking is the be good, usually. We can usually uh, trace back to that. No, it's it's very difficult to get the reward structures to yeah. reward the correct correct kind of behavior. No, 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 we're just talking about this is all jobs and data specific to person. No, 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 no. I I think what you're doing is fine. I'm I'm thinking the the general case of trying to build a a, a distributed storage system has has been tried. Oh, certainly many. that's almost always failed. This yeah, it's always got to be special purpose. Right. There is a service uh, all my data that's trying to get going. Yeah. And it's based, I believe, on an open source distributed file system yes. that does many of the things you do and a few more. Um, yeah. General, the, 
this is not technology. This is about people's motivations for the right, right. behavior yeah. and the difficulty of preventing people moti being motivated to do the wrong thing. Yes. And, yeah. and distributed storage systems like that are very open to uh, malign behavior. The, uh, this service has some good security features built in low to, yeah. to, to make sure that people, the wrong people don't get data. Yeah. And also, well, they have erasure coding, so they don't have to duplicate to get all of right. the nines and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's certainly <laughs> other ways to do this. I'm sure. That, is, are they actually storing like your data on other people's? Yes. Or are, is it a centralized? Yes. Oh, they they well. store many people's data on many mach people's machines. Oh. It'll be interesting to see if that works. But yeah. there, like you said, there's a history of that exact and, idea of not working very and well. Mo and motivation is indeed a tricky problem. Yeah. Yes, there's a system called Samsara which uh, tried to do this and, and pretty much demonstrated that it's really, really hard to get the motivations right. Yeah. So I'm going to actually move on because I'm going to get a bunch <laughs> of slides here. Um, so let's talk about the jobs that we're doing in this new system. Now we've flipped all the arrows around. Um, so really in distributed systems, these are all, you should really just think of these as batch jobs. They're not interactive, they're not time, there's deadlines, but they're not time critical, interactive, or anything like that. They're running in idle mode, they're batch jobs. Um, every job in the system has a header that tracks a bunch of data about the job, gives it things that the, the scheduler and other things need to know. Um, but after that, it's really just data and state. Um, and the state part of it is, is important, I think, that, yeah. Anyway, so when I wanna do a research project, I create some jobs. I create them in a suspended, suspended mode, and I just dump them in my local collection of jobs. Um, and then the co uh, coordinator comes and you add it to that and let it know, hey, there's some jobs over here, and it collects up the things it needs to know, and it starts sending them out. But it's tagged with a bunch of data, things like I need to run on a Windows PC because the science I'm going to do has only been ported to that. I need <coughs> to run on a GPU because otherwise, the, you know, it's not available anywhere else. Um, this is an important one. This is, I, uh, I want to run on a specific host because that's where the data is. And I created this job to work on that data. So it needs to be one of these four. Um, there's size limits on all these things. This is how much memory it's going to take. This is how much temporary storage it's going to take. Um, so there's a bunch of just kind of batch job parameters on this. Um, how long I estimate this will run. Uh, based on a benchmarking machine, and then the priority based on other things. So if I'm at one of these conference deadlines, I would give these jobs a very high priority. Um, so the coordinators, you know, optimizing all this from a central location, saying, um, you know, it's moving the jobs around, moving them from just being idle somewhere to actually going and being run somewhere. Um, and one of the things about distributed systems is you've got to be doing checkpointing all the time. You never know when these random failures are going to happen. So you're doing checkpointing every 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever you've decided is reasonable. Um, so that's always happening. But these checkpoints are actually the job format. So these checkpoints can be moved around. You're not actually checkpointing in the classical process migration, which is you take a snapshot of your entire memory and you're shipping that around. No, these are like, like a save format. It's very small compared to the memory image or anything like this. Um, and then the coordinator can also look around and see, are you still running what I gave you? Is it still going on? And, and see basically the job queue of the entire system. Um, the mirror of jobs is clients. Um, each client has a set of capabilities, just like the job has a set of needs. It's got an, a given operating system, one or more CPUs, like you could have a CPU and a GPU, and it's got four CPUs, so you could run an SMP client on it. Um, it's got limits that the user has set of the amount of um, memory it's allowed to use. Say I only have 512 megabytes of memory for some odd reason, it's an old machine. I don't want to get assigned a job that has a gigabyte need. It doesn't work too well. Um, on the other end, if I have a ton of memory, I want to say, hey, you can use a lot of memory and it's not a big deal. Um, I want to say what times of day it can run, if this is a machine at a company or it's just I do actually use my computer during the day. Maybe I just don't want things running during the day. I want to leave it up on overnight and switch off the monitor and let it do whatever it needs to do. Um, and then every client has a history with it. This is how reliable is this host? Does it, does it turn things in on time? 
Is it not as fast as it should be? It should be so we shouldn't be giving it these long-running jobs. Maybe they won't finish by deadline. Um, so we're going to build up a model of each each client. Um, and then, for instance, if they're going to go offline at a given time, we can step in before that and move the job to another machine. Maybe we've decided that's a high priority thing, and we really want to make sure that gets done in the very soon versus waiting a 12 hours for it to start start up again. Um, and again, the job coordinator is just the brain running all this stuff. But the, the key here is you can do global optimization of the system. You can get the most throughput out of the system if you can move things around and do stuff and balance data and all these other things. Um, and this has just got a list of projects and saying these projects are more important than others. Get them out sooner, get them out later. Don't worry about this one. Um, kind of classic job scheduler. There's, there's not a lot of magic here. Um, but we're going to start adding some magic with maybe some machine learning because we know so much, starting learning a profile of a given client. We can start doing a little more advanced stuff, um, and that'll be future work. Um, the key to all this is it gives us new capabilities, things we can't do with the current system. Even though we have lots of hosts, the things we can do them are kind of you know, routine. You've got to set up a project. You've got to wait for clients to come in, all these things. Um, we can ask these, these step two questions. What, if, what does the data say? What, are the attribute, what stuff is in this data? We produced it all. Let's, maybe I just want to pull an energy calculation out of a ton of stuff. I can do that. Um, the other nice thing is because data can, these ports are open, uh, we can migrate data to other researchers too. So if somebody wants a copy of a data set, we just tell them, hey, you're going to need this much space. And we do data, just the same data migration process we would use doing repairs or load balancing, push them all the data. Um, so that's nice because if they're just one point and we're sending, we actually have to avoid denial of servicing them. Uh, but we can send them data very quickly. So if they've got internet two connections, we can like get them all the data very quickly. And, and that's nice because then you have more people working with the data you work so hard to get. Um, and then of course, we'll get these statistics about the internet itself and hosts themselves. And hopefully we'll get some cool stuff out of that too. So uh, it's the end of the jobs part. Um, but in summary, we're finally putting storage into our computational infrastructure um, and enabling this, this further analysis and exploring hopefully the protein research. Uh, people will be able to do that even faster. Um, and they'll be happy, which I like them to be. Um, so I gotta thank, of course, all the contributors, these, all these people out on the internet who help us, um, the staff of distributed.net and Folding Home, um, Vijay Pandey, who's the PI in our lab, who does so much work <laughs> uh, to do this, and the whole lab crew. I'm not gonna name anyone because then I won't be naming someone, and then, yeah. Anyway, um, but the entire lab puts a lot of time into this. Um, we have forum moderators who do a ton of work interfacing with people who have questions. And they really, without them, there's no way we could handle that number of people. Um, and then of course, the funding sources are donors, NSF, NIH, and a bunch of other people. So more questions. So what kind of uh, monitoring and management tools do you have at your end? And um, you know, the flip side is, do you have uh, sophisticated debugging tools? How do you know when things go wrong? So um, if something goes wrong in the field, we'll just get kind of an error code saying this happened. We do a lot of debugging and testing before we send code out to run. Um, but it is, I mean, we're doing this now with the beta of the GPU clients. Stuff happens, and we don't always know what happened. So debugging is, in a distributed system is really difficult, but you just do a lot of testing and hope for the best. And things generally, you find the bugs, and things get pretty stable after a month or two. <laughs> I just wonder, if I was running a for-profit organization and wanted to do computation, would it actually make sense to use this model? Because presumably, you know, I don't get my freebie internet to connection, and right. I also want it done faster and more predictably. And, right. and you know, even your comparison at the beginning, I would think that the total number of machines you're using is different than the number of machines that you harness within one cluster. Uh, so the equivalence, I mean, it might be that 
to have a hundred number of machines and get more done more quickly, more quickly. Right. So, so if you're for profit and you have types of problems that maybe don't need distributed methods or work well in clusters, well, there's tons of algorithms. I, I figure out I'm going to make a fortune by doing protein folding. It's right. really more effective for me to just build a cluster locally. If so I people don't do have this. the internet, yeah. I don't have the yeah. luxury of taking forever because I'm paying you know, real salaries to real people and time yeah. to market and all that sort so of stuff. So generally, if you're a for-profit company, you just build a cluster or you rent time. Um, that is the model. Well, I know um, that's, that's the practice, but what I'm asking is, is it does better? it make sense to do what you're doing in that situation or not? Yeah, I don't think it makes sense to do this type of thing if you're for-profit because the number of volunteers you're going to get even if you pay them, because if you pay them, their incentive to cheat goes way up. So the number of people you're going to get to volunteer is going to be far, far less. So it's a social problem, problem, not a technical problem. It, it is problem. a social problem. It has nothing to do with the technology. Well, the, the problem about payments right now, the transaction cost, you pay a dollar in order to, to transact to, a yeah, dime. To pay a that's, dollar, yeah. yeah. That's a killer. Yeah, the transaction costs are high. So something like Amazon for that situation is really good. Corporation right. that everybody loves. So, yeah. so even if everybody volunteers at the same level, no one seems to do, does it yeah. still make sense? It doesn't make sense to build your own if you can do this. But do really you know the numbers? I, I really well, I mean, a billion dollars to, to run would be a lot more than what we're spending on our, you know, we've got research grants as, as funding. They're a little less than a billion dollars. So. Well, but I'm not sure I buy that comparison because if I've got something that's connected. By a 10 gigabit network, yeah. you know, a bunch of blades, multi core, right. sitting inside my own uh, situation, then I can run these jobs much, much faster. Right. And so I if the algorithms you're using can I go on a cluster, everything, I don't have to check you should all the do stuff, that. And I'm not paying the cost of right. the commercial cost of an Internet 2 connection. Right. But there's also an interview. You have 250,000 machines. Yeah. But what fraction of those machines do you actually have? If you only have one hundredth of each machine, then you really only have some. No, no, those are active. Yeah, that's active yeah. machines, but you don't have the whole machine. No. So if I have 200, if I can afford a data center with 250,000 machines, yeah. I have a better bandwidth and I've got the whole machine. Right. Actually, we do have probably a large fraction of each of those machines. Okay. That, that's, I so think that's one, then maybe that answers your question. Part of the we're running it out of the priority 24 hours a day. People are trying to meet deadlines. It's not really off. Almost all software you run doesn't use a pathetic fraction of your CPU. So we're running all the time. Um, and, and it depends on where your uh, your bottleneck is. Yeah, I mean, if, is if you have an algorithm that needs inter uh, intercommunication, you can't do this. It's not possible, so there's no question. It's just the algorithm won't work. You have to change your algorithm first to one that doesn't need intercommunication, and then you can consider something like this. So until you change your algorithm, you need a cluster. And tons of algorithms do that. There is a middle ground, too, between the question there, um, and that's the, the grid computing buzzword, which I don't hear much about these days. But yeah, it's cloud computing now. What's it called? It's cloud computing now. Cloud computing. But I don't then, slide about the terms that have been applied to what I do over the last 10 years. Right. Um, but, but within a pharmaceutical company, a, yeah. a large one, which actually does have 10,000 hosts, right. uh, they can reach not, not 275,000, but maybe 1% of that. Yeah. I guess that would translate into $10 million worth of computing uh, power just for the grid approach. Uh, internally. So yeah, and companies do do this within their companies. Companies that have 10,000 PCs on desks do this. Actually, we, we, can't, we do know that you, you lost half your machines because you're doing each computation twice. No, we're not. Somebody like SETI at home is. Well, okay. Okay, so if you were doing it twice. Effective, the effective, so yeah. you're getting half of the machine because you're doing redundant comp yeah. computation. So you already lost, you lose a factor of right. two there, you lose a factor of two roughly to you really don't have 250,000 machines, you have 50,000 machines. Okay. Or, so, I mean, which is still a large number. there's no A is better than B here. There is, there's A and there's B, and yeah. depending on what you want to do, one is probably better for you. And if you... Right, but that, the fact that this, you know, say 75% sort of overhead is, pales against, you know, being one one thousandth or one ten thousandth of the price, right? Yeah. Or one one hundred thousandth of the price, depending on what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, it, you've got to figure out which is better for a given situation. Good, fast, cheap. Yeah, Where exactly. Go? Good, fast, cheap. And, uh, yeah. Well. And we forgot control, which is more important than all three of those. 
Yeah, so another issue with if you're doing commercial stuff is you don't want your data out there and you probably don't want your code out there either. It's probably some internal top secret patented algorithm. You certainly don't want to send your code out to someone to be well, using no, it. Nobody said you can't encrypt the computation. Yeah, it turns out it's doing encrypted computation is really, really hard and applicable well, to a very a small number of problems. Did, I guess you didn't work on that. Yeah. I'm surprised actually, why encrypted computation? Why don't you just do this cited Russian mafia thing? Just, and just go out there and search all the available laptops. Who, who cares whether or not you have permission? Yeah, so actually the commercial side of this is sadly, uh, and I took the slide out, is is that it's the spyware guys, it's the spammers, the spam bot networks of 50,000 machines that don't ask and are definitely not good. Um, that's where your spam's coming from. In fact, I just got, somehow my email got sent, is now in one of these Russian networks as a from, so I'm getting thousands an hour of these bounced mails. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and they have a thousand times the resources we have. They're paid a lot of money. There's big money in these. Uh, spyware, spy bot networks, and they're certainly doing many of these things, and you have to watch them. Um, and I'm not watching them to like fight with them. I'm looking for good ideas, because they've got hundreds of people working on these things full time, and you job, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> alternative funding ideas. <laughs> but um, they just have more people thinking about this problem, and their and their constraint is that they have to be kind of sneaky about it. But some of those sneaky methods you can make not sneaky, and they're really good ideas. So you have to watch what kind of the, the black hats are up to, because they come up with good stuff just as often as the white hat guys. So. Did you have like a market for new projects or ideas or codes or whatever, like even within the protein level? So I don't actually come do the protein folding part. Um, the people in the group, though, are always working on new algorithms and always coming up with new stuff and pushing the technology farther. And but how much of what you're doing is open source? And what kind of people so um, Gromax is available. Um, I know VJ wants to make more of our custom things available. He's announced we're probably, so I can say this, they're, uh, we're probably going to start releasing more of our code, our client, like more of a complete thing you could have actually run on your own. Um, like the PS3 code, I think, is the first thing we're going to put out there. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's really, yeah. Uh, we need more competition, so we need them to speed up, um, <laughs> is how I think about it. But it, and not in a condescending way, but I mean, folding at home is really big power and powerful, and we're doing stuff that's really on the edge, and we'd like other people to be able to do that to you. So, I think we're. Out of time. Or? So, all right. And I guess I'll end it there. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.